when this segment of uh, the office discussions for the intro to philosophy that we've been engaging upon, um, I want to discuss a few things, uh, some terms, and then some of the readings that I've assigned. And one term that has uh, popped up in uh, in our readings is the term rationalism. And rationalism is the idea that you can know things and be certain of them. Now, see, now knowledge and certainty is kind of tricky. Those are those are troubled waters because. Uh, what does it mean to be certain about something? And what does it mean to know it? And uh, what does it mean to believe it? Okay, so uh, just I'll throw some things out to you. If you know something, it seems to me that you also must believe it. Yet in common discussion and colloquial terms, as we discuss things with our neighbors, we often say, well, you know, I'll go ahead and and uh, you know sort of place my bets on something, and I'm going to act as if it's a certainty. And but we don't even really know. So we, we might hear the weather report that tomorrow is 80% rain, and thus we start rearranging our plans because we are going to go ahead and work on the side of probability, right? So. Um, but we don't really know whether it's going to rain and we don't necessarily even believe that it is going to rain uh, but yet we might sometimes say we believe I believe it's going to rain tomorrow so there's a very sloppy way in which we use the word believe um, I, I just have to work with uh, some some things that seems uh, self-evident and, and hard to deny things that seem self-evident and one being if if, if, if you say you know something, you will also believe it. Now, I'm, I'm <clears throat> let's make a distinction here, all right? For, for example, there, there is someone that may say, why? Well, I, I know that, you know, something exists. For example, I know that, that uh, pick, pick an Indian guru or, or some, somebody that has a way of life delineated for you and all you have to do is follow it right and, and let's say this person is, is making some claims like uh, we came from another planet uh, or another place altogether um, we're headed to another place after we die um, but very uh, well just pick pick there are many people that will say that sort of thing pick pick your favorite cult leader perhaps all right and uh, it might be worth uh, looking at a few of these cults in uh, the last 20 or 30 years to see, um, or maybe in the last century, cults in the last century to see uh, what strange things the cult members actually ended up believing via the uh, encouragement of the cult leader. But uh, so pick pick your favorite shaman all right and, and, and you know what give me his name let me see uh, some historical evidence as to whether or not he is actually existing and I might come to the point where I say look I, I know that he exists all right but um, I don't believe in him so now we go believe in him or believe him all right so so you might be very comfortable actually you might actually believe that something exists but let's not confuse that sort of belief I'm gonna call that ontological belief ontology being the study of being of essence of will of being the ontological belief you know I, I, I believe this fellow exists but now do you believe in him okay so maybe we should call that soteriological belief soteriology is 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 the idea of um, depending on someone for the right way of life and for eventual um, well there's no there's no better term salvation uh, from whatever thing you you think you need saving from so um, that would be soteriology a, a very general uh, sort of diluted um, type of soteriological belief okay now 
let's just talk about ontological belief, all right? So if you, if, if you know something, you have to also believe it. Um, if you believe it, <clears throat> I'm going to say that doesn't necessarily mean that you know it. I'm going to say if you don't believe it, then you don't know it. Because if you know it, you believe it. Okay. Now, where in this is certainty? Now, certainty, it seems useful to me to define the word certainty to mean not having any doubt about a propositions. Remember, we're talking about, um, let's, just, let's just kind of take a simplistic view of it and say, if you know something, you know facts. All right, but if it's a fact, it can be written down as a proposition. So we're really, in the essence, talking about propositions here. And um, which would, I guess, I would have to admit. Um, <clears throat> see, this is this is why the word knowledge and know. What does it mean to know? What does it mean to believe? Gets a little tricky here because. Uh, uh, see, the thing is, do facts have to be true to be facts? And let's go ahead and say yes to that. That if they're not true, um, we will, as soon as we find out they're not true, we refuse to think of them as in terms of facts. All right. So, um, you know, now, if you know something, though, then you can't be deceived about it, right? So that means if you know something, that what you know has to be true because if it's false you are deceived about it and thus you cannot know it so um, when you really think about what it means to know something there's a very high standard and it seems the standard seems to come about just by how you can de define the word and uh, we, we often do not you know relegate that word to that high standard in everyday common use of, of our of our speech and so there is a colloquial way of speaking but then there's the philosophically rigorous way of speaking and if you want to quickly be very uh, irritating and annoying to people insist on a philosophically rigorous way of speaking all right we just don't work that way um, we enjoy looseness in speech th it, when we're with friends and unless unless we have serious business to do in in, in, in in reaching a conclusion right so I would never insist on philosophical rigor you know every minute of the day by, by no means you know good luck playing with your kids and uh, and then uh, enjoying a date with your significant other so uh, but you know when you're really trying to come down to it you do need to employ philosophical rigor and knowledge is just is, is trouble it's, it's it's hard to really uh, settle down on a definition that at the end will allow you to say that you know things okay so i think that there is nevertheless i think we are forced into accepting the definition of okay if you know something then you are deceived by it if you're not deceived by it then it must be true if it's true it must correspond to reality so if you know something, then you know something about reality in such a way that you're not wrong. I mean, that, 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 is, that is reality. You've somehow accessed it as it is. All right, so uh, in its basic state. So somehow you're eluding, all, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're sliding past all the sensory, the problems with sensory data, Descartes' problem. All right, now, um, conviction, I think we should, uh, uh, Certainty. I think we should we should define it. I'm fine if it's a working definition, but let's go ahead and run with the idea that certainty is um, the absence of doubt in you about the truth of a certain proposition. Which then would allow me to say that you can be certain about something, but in the end, fooled by it. And I think certainty does sort of lodge itself in a psychological state. Uh, de depending on uh, the, the recognition of a person of doubt inside all right um, now I also want to be careful about uh, certain things um, there are received manuscripts that talk about uh, knowledge and um, believing and certainty but often 
and um, uh, our our modern culture, which I'm going to be uh, assuming is American, uh, the American or the English modern culture, is is a uh, is coming to these documents through translation and as careful a group of translators may intend to be there are decisions made in translation in the act of translation that at times involve more of um, I don't want to even say the word but ar ar arbitrary maybe uh, renditions of well why not this phrase as opposed to that phrase and when you work in translation you are in general w working towards one of two goals now I don't think you can really work towards both goals at once but you are either trying to render a foreign language text into your language um, in such a way that is it is grammatically and technically aligned to the foreign language text. I mean, I'm talking about syntax and phraseology and arrangement of words uh, and phrases and sentence mechanic. Uh, this would be the uh, the formal translation, okay? And it's much more, the virtue is, hey, I'm, tr I'm trying to give you it, the, the translation pretty much just as the words are on the page. I mean, in the, I'm not even mixing around their order, so it might be a little awkward to read, but you know that this is, if you get a hang of the word order and, and, and you see what's happening here, uh, this is gonna be very faithful to the original the original linguistics and, and uh, syntax of the original, okay? But then there's another school of translation that says, well, you know, we we don't want to really look so much at the words themselves, which which the term for that is the vehicle. We don't want to we don't want to be so strapped to the vehicle that we clump we end up with a very clunky text. We're going to pay more attention to what that that foreign language text is actually saying, okay? Is actually saying, and we're going to try to retain that message, but in our terms, as much as we can. We're gonna it's it's a balance, you know. If, if the analogy used in the original was of a fig tree and and we understand that our modern culture still understands that and we're going to use the fig tree but if the analogy was of some uh, very strange concept like the eye of the needle and 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 here which might have been a, a, a doorway and a gate and here since we don't have gates in our modern cities uh, we aren't necessarily going to talk about that maybe we'll talk about trying to squeeze through I don't know you know but, but the idea would be, well, let's come up with a new analogy. Just as long as the essential heart of the message, the message is kept, what it was actually trying to say is still being said with our new figures of speech and our new examples. Uh, that would be a, a, an example of a rather fully, um, of, of what's called dynamic translation. If it's largely dynamic, then they're not really concerned about, you know, keeping all the figures of speech you know, there and 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 uh, rather and, uh, and the exact word order or word usage. Rather, they're more interested in just what was it really trying to say. Okay, now let's make a, an English or a, a a text in our language that says that that very same thing, one way or the other. So, um, but the thing about trying to take a dynamic approach, okay, is that you are very unwilling to let original words stand. So if you don't know the definition or the translation of a word, even its technical one, you are very unwilling just to leave, just to let that alone and say, we don't know how to translate this word. Or, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, picture yourself, uh, you know, as having grown up in medieval France. All right. Now, now, while you're doing this thought experiment with me, think of how you've grown up now. Think of all the nuances you know of speech. Think of how something can mean something else if the tone isn't there, or if the tone is different, or if pause, the pauses aren't placed right. Think of all the allusions to common modern day things that carry meaning to them. Like, uh, just, how about this, it came up all cherries. Okay, now a lot of people are going to think of, hey, you know, he won the jackpot. It came up all cherries. All right, so it came up all cherries. But now, so let's just, 
think back to medieval France, and let's just say that your life was as full as it is now, in, in the way you grew up now, but it was as full then of all those nuances and little sayings about the, the common pond and the, the, I mean, I don't know, I mean, just whatever that uh, you may have been involved with in everyday life back there. You know how you figureize things. You know how you, you make shortcut, verbal shortcuts and semantic shortcuts and you come up with figures of speech and, and people understand it because they've, they've uh, heard that other person speak or they know what you're talking, they've been to that cathedral or they've seen that dangerous river or whatever and, um, or they've, they've read those other manuscripts that you've read, okay? Or they've seen that play and they know what you mean by that phrase, that little phrase. Now Shakespeare was pretty good at this, all right? Um, he, would, he, he knew what his audience was watching because he just knew the other playwrights. He knew what they were saying and he would often make fun of them by including little snippets of their plays in his own plays if it was a rival playwright. But he would put that material and say in the mouth of a fool or somebody. Um, now, Let's just say now you're a translator of 21st century America. You lived here and you're going to go and you find this medieval manuscript. Unless you grew up in that medieval town and you know all those nuances, do you know how hard it would be to accurately represent what was the meaning of those things? Okay, so when I look at, I, I, what you need is you need a translator that not only knows the language, but knows the culture of medieval France and knows the plays and the manuscripts, the drama, the manuscripts, the church ritual, the local versions of the church ritual, the, 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 the feuding of, of the nobles and the allegiances that were playing back and forth between the people associated with the nobles, the geographies of the land. I mean, you need to know so much to be able to recognize maybe the figurative way that phrase is being rendered and you thought it was literal, but everyone back there in medieval France at that time would know exactly what that phrase means, and they know, would know it's figurative. So, you know, what I am trying to say is that in some Greek literature, in some uh, 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 religious literature, uh, when, when something is rendered no by the translator, and it's a certain word in the Greek, but that translator doesn't know that's, that that certain word has three or four different ways it can be applied, and it does, and, and that translator doesn't know the way other texts, contemporaneous texts of the one he's trying to translate, have been using that term. Things can get very sloppy very quickly, and you know you could be tied into a translation. And be and be committed to it, and not even realize that the thing was a shoddy translation because the translators never took time to really immerse themselves not only in that particular text but in all the other popular texts of that time. Popular meaning they were uh, actually read and in use during that time. So, um, you know, these these words know, believe, con uh, uh, certainty. They're they're ha hallowed words. They're sacred words. But uh, sometimes I wonder whether we have turned them into sacred cows because uh, of the translations we approach them through. But anyway, you know, that, that was quite a digression. But um, if you're a rationalist, let's get back to the term, you are going to believe that you know things. That means that you can access the truth through reason. All right, so Descartes would certainly have been a rationalist. And it is through reason that you um, and only through reason that you establish the starting points of whatever it is you're going to develop in terms of what you eventually think you know. The collection of things you know is going to have some starting points and those starting points have to be based in reason alone. And so the truths are going to be self-evident. Well, let's, let's back it up. Uh, some, some starting points that would work for a rationalist would obviously be mathematics. Okay. There would also be symbolic logic. Uh, and then as soon as you get the symbolic logic going, you can fill it in with propositions. Okay, so that's, that's, those are, and then, you know, you would, you would also, in order, um, you could probably start some things off by uh, uh, 
what's called tautology, well, by just setting the definition, like a bachelor, what is a bachelor? Well, it's an unmarried male. Okay, so you have a, you have a, a direct relation, right? And that doesn't seem to tell you much about whether or not a bachelor exists, but um, you do at least know that an unmarried male is a bachelor, and a bachelor is an unmarried male. So um, there is a sort of type of knowledge that comes around with this uh, that gets you ready, okay, to see whether or not it's going to actually be applied to reality. So now that we understand what a bachelor is, it's uh, we we have the um, the system set up so that when we actually become convinced that there does exist a bachelor, we can plug it into the system of our knowledge base and see where it gets us. But anyway, um, th there are some troubles with th that idea of knowledge through tautology, but but uh, another locus of um, starting points for a rationalist is going to be anything that is supremely clear in its own right. Any idea that by its by its by its clarity and by its self-evident qualities can be seen that it is nearly impossible for it to be false and and for the rationalist the rationalist would have to say well it's impossible that it's false it is so clear that um, <clears throat> those would form valuable starting points they're few and far between all right but if you think about something long enough you might be able to convince yourself that it's just it's just it's just clear it is absolutely clear that this is this has to be the case okay um, so you can see rationalists well well will say that they know things very hesitantly. That's, that's a precious terminology for them. And um, they will uh, be very careful about how they talk cons about propositions that depend on sensory data. All right, now again, you know, I, one thing I do appreciate about Blackburn is that he always seems to, to have one foot firmly anchored in just common sense and common everyday experience because he's gonna tell you it's going to be hard for anybody to to really live life that way. Uh, but so I, I suppose we should call a rationalist as as, to, as a person is a person who, at the end of the day, holds his or her core beliefs. Really, the core beliefs he does hold have to pass the test of logic and reason. Um, so uh, just basic the basic rules of, of, of propositional logic and reason and uh, and once they are past those if if the notions he holds to are sufficiently clear for him or her he's just gonna say they are true because that they're so self-evidently true and then from those starting points now we can call them presuppositions okay then the edifice of those propositions, the collection of the propositions this person is going to adhere to can become something you can collect together. All right, so I'm going to try to do this, all right. Ah, see, Plato was just a, a very, a very good rationalist and uh, I can't do it the way he did it, but you know, it's just a quick side step as, and I'll try to talk about Ion and, and again in another video, but as you read Ion, I, I hope you saw the logic chopping that that Plato was putting Ion through, and how he and uh, or Socrates, Socrates was putting Ion through, and and Ion at the end. I mean, you 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 had to feel for that guy because at the end he doesn't know what he's saying. I mean, he's and, and he's trying to say face at the end, and he's trying to say yes, I'm I'm a great general. Okay, yeah, I guess I guess I'm a great general. And then Socrates very kindly, you know, lets him off the hook. You should read that again. That's a, a lesson in and attacked but uh so there, there was rationalism right there as far as the process of what are we going to accept as true all right and uh so now one thing that plato through socrates i say plato and socrates because so socrates doesn't exist for us only but only through plato plato is the only one who wrote about him and in that way with those dialogues and we know about Socrates almost exclusively because of what we know through Plato but it was always through Plato so you know 
was it the real Socrates? Well, Plato fortunately really liked Socrates. Plato was Socrates' student, best student. So, um, you know, he, he wrote favorably about his master. But, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I, the idea there is, uh, you know, you, you don't even know where your own thoughts come from. You know, you cannot say with certainty that they come from some essential part of you. So here is Ion that, you know, becomes alive only when he hears Homer and bores out and sleeps away the time when he hears anybody else. And Plato was trying to tell him, it's not because you know Homer, and it's not because you know poetry. In fact, you become alive when you hear Homer because you are possessed by the gods. And that is literally what Plato was saying. I mean, he's arguing for the idea that, I mean, at the end of it, what you can walk away from Ion is saying, well, well, we don't know where our thoughts are coming from. We do not know where they are coming from. We don't know what makes us desire what we desire. We know that we desire something. We know that we rejoice in something, but we don't know what makes us rejoice in something. So, uh, we don't, and we can't even tell where where our thoughts are coming from. You know, if so, let me ask you to quickly just do something. Think of five uh, animals right now. Okay, think of five um, heavenly bodies right now: planet, comets, asteroid. Okay, now right now, think of just five things. Five things. Anything. Hey, were you able to come up with five? Where did they come from? Where you know, I gave you some direction for the first two. So you, you know, you looked at the category and you, but, but I wanted to say even with that, how, how did you? Why did you pick star and not space dust, star dust, not dust? Uh, you know, space is full of dust. Uh, wh why did you pick uh, a meteorite instead of a comet? And and when I just asked you for five things for whatever, why did you pick that? Well, you might have looked around and. I say, well, okay, I got the chair, you know, and, and so you're looking at stuff you see. You know what I should have said? I said, now close your eyes and think of five things just off the top of your head. Wh where are those thoughts coming from? Well, they're coming from in here. Well, well, how do you know? What if they're coming from outside and passing through? What if there is actually somebody that's putting those thoughts in your head? How can you say that's not happening? Can you... Did you, you didn't feel it. You don't really know where they came from inside. You can't tell me that they come from like this gland or your pinky or your liver. And the thoughts don't come from your liver. Do they come from your liver? Uh, well, well, if you can't even tell me where they come from inside your body, how do you know they come from inside your body? So maybe they do come in through the ear. Uh, maybe your head is an interface. When it gets married with another interface, you get those thoughts. Um, it can, you can have all sorts of, and, and Plato, I think, is just trying to tell Ion, um, hey, it's not in you. You know, you don't know where it's coming from. And you know, I, I, I think I, I would put my my money down on on the side of Plato was actually trying to argue, or Socrates was trying to say to Plato, it is enthusiasm, enthusiasm in the literal sense, possession by the god. Or at the, now Plato or Socrates is a little funny here. You know, he, he's very willing to talk about the gods, but he is convinced there's only one god, singular, and it's it's a, a life force. It's a personal uh, power, personal. All right, and uh, so he's 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 trying to convince Ion that um, at that moment he is channeling something other than himself, and that's why he is the expert of Homer. But uh, let's let's just talk. Let's bring it back to rationalism qu quickly here. Um, now I I I can't do this. I haven't really practiced this, so let's see how it goes. Okay, but I I, I do know what is is at play here. Think of oh uh, boy. Think of uh, think of a. Um, a tomato plant, okay? All right. Now think of first of all, let's think of a tomato plant like it's gone through a really dry season. So it's kind of withered and okay. 
Now, think of um, one that has sufficient water now. So maybe it's a little taller and greener. Now, which one of those two is better? Well, you're thinking, well, how am I going to define better? Maybe in terms of which one produces the better tomato. Uh oh, all right. So which one is better? So well, okay, the the, the one with more water, the one that's like at least has flowers and greenery and all that. Okay. So now, but let's just say that one has has tomatoes and all that, but it doesn't really get a lot of full sun. It gets enough water, but and it's but its soil is okay, and but it doesn't just get it a full sun. Now. But that's obviously better than the one we just started with, the withered one. Let's go one better. Let's get one that gets just the same type of water as that second one, but the soil is better. More nutrients, better balance for the uh, tomato, and it gets at least six hours of sun a day. Nice, full sun. Which one of those two is going to produce better tomatoes? Well, the third one, the one with the better sun and the better... Okay, all right. You see what I'm doing. We can get it better and better. But my question to you is, how did you know that the one, those tomatoes from that third plant are actually better than the ones from the second one. What's your, what's your notion of, because if, if we're getting it only from, if we're getting it only from um, sensory experience, okay, how did we ever come up with the idea of the perfect tomato versus the best tomato we've ever experienced. Okay? So, philosophers, so I, it, some philosophers have played with this notion and said, look, if we are able to abstract away from particular instances and, and realize that this one is better than that one and that one is better than this one still and this one is the best of them all, how do we even know to make those distinctions unless we have the notion of the perfect tomato? Now Plato is going to tell you, you did have that notion and you forgot it. So that's a come, you can't really see it right now, but you can remember it in echoes. And the more you think about it, the more chances you have to fully remember it. But you do remember some of it, so you can recognize that that third plant is producing better tomatoes. If only you had never forgotten you would you would perhaps be unsatisfied with all three because you know the perfect tomato but Plato will if he didn't say this in Ion but he'll say it elsewhere and, and and other philosophers have said this too and Descartes is saying this when he talks about the perfect the idea of a perfect God because we don't even understand perfection without having it being planted in us um, must be sort of a proof that there is God okay I personally don't, I mean, well, no, I, I do see, I do see, we'll have to spend some more time, uh, you know, tickling this notion out, but, but, uh, C.S. Lewis sort of bought into that, uh, Descartes here is doing it, Anselm, uh, um, based his whole theology on that, um, uh, Plato, so it's, it's an idea worth thinking about, and, um, rationalists will say, well, you see, we do know. We do know something for sure. We know that um, there, there must be perfection somewhere. Because we wouldn't even know how to judge gradations without first knowing perfection. Um, so that would be the, an example for a rationalist of a truth that's not mathematical and not necessarily logical, but, but if you think about it long enough, simply so stark clear that how can it be otherwise